Hello and welcome to Virtual Concert Halls. Thank you for joining us today. Our channel is dedicated to bringing live performances and events from international artists delivered to audiences around the globe. Hello and welcome. My name is Chris Al and I'll be your host today. I'll be joined by some amazing people later on, but I want to tell you a little bit about our special program today. Our special program today presents part two of our story and our story of the Carnegie Hall auditions and the Laureate Scala and everything that happened before, during and after. It's a very special show we have for you um, as we present the interviews as well as performances that the Laureate of the Carnegie Hall Gala uh, performed. Now, what's really important, especially tonight, is that we get special interviews presented um, by our esteemed partner and collaborator, Steve Robinson. Steve Robinson, who is really well known as a radio broadcaster and uh, a, a philanthropist and someone who really supports musicians and has broadcast from all over the world, he took the time to go to Manhattan Club and interview each and every one of the performers for the Laureate Scala and talk to them about the Carnegie Hall experience uh, arriving in New York for the first time. A lot of them only came for, to the US for the first time. Uh, their impressions of the city, what they're about to expect and the amazing performance that has uh, that will be uh, that they will be about to perform. So what's really, really beautiful about this experience is you get to witness the performances of these contestants and these performers and these winners, and also you get a little sneak peek of who they are as a person and their experience and their process behind being able to perform for the first time, a lot of them, at Carnegie Hall. We're really pleased to be able to host this, and we hope you join us, and we hope that you continue to support us. Feel free to leave a comment below Give us some love and give and and let let your family and friends know about our very special event. Now we are supported very heavily by amazing organizations. We rely on these organizations not only for their support and their uh, amazing promotional support, but also for making this all happen. We have to thank Sound Espresso for competition for making these uh, broadcasts and these. These competence happen for amazing musicians who can play uh, exceptionally well. We have to thank Progressive Musicians. Progressive Musicians is an incredible organization who aims to put musicians, especially really good ones, onto the international stage and in prestigious venues like Carnegie Hall. We also have to thank Virtual Concert Halls, uh, who is an internet TV broadcaster and providing artists with a virtual stage to perform Anyway, if you're interested in virtual concert halls hosting your live events and your concerts, feel free to check us out at www.virtualconcerthalls.com and we can do anything for you. And we, this is an example of what we're able to host uh, and our capabilities. We also have to thank the New York Chamber Players, conducted by Maestro Giacomo Franchi, who is an amazing conductor who rehearsed with each and every one of the soloists. And the New York Chamber Players are incredibly professional and they accompanied all the soloists who performed at Carnegie Hall that evening. This is a very special event and we're really proud to bring you part two of our story where all this began and to present with you um, these performances and hope you really enjoy what we have to offer. We also have to thank very much our judges. So the process behind all these auditions is that there are preliminary rounds where students can um, submit a recording, submit something, an application, and then each round is actually live. They get to play live for judges, and these judges will listen to their entire performances, and usually there aren't any time limit, so they can play for as long as they want, and then the judges give live feedback. Live feedback is a very special and exceptional part of the sound of a competition experience where judges are able to give comments and advice usually uh, sometimes it's a mini masterclass even to the contestants so what happens is they perform and then they get live feedback they get to have some closure about their performance and how the judges saw them so first of all we have to introduce benjamin hansen benjamin hansen 
as a musician who is a founder and artistic director of the Helios Ensemble and an award-winning uh, SATB semi-professional choral group in Tucson, Arizona. He is the interim co-director of the Tuscan uh, Symphony Orchestra, chorus director of music at Catalina United Methodist Church. He has conducted works such as the Bach's Mass in B minor, Hans Messiah, just to name a few. He's an incredible musician, and we're really happy to have Benjamin Hansen as one of our judges. We also had Emil Shudnovsky, who is an incredible friend of the Soundless Perceiver and Virtual Concert Halls, and is an amazing violinist. He has won incredible awards, as, as, especially the first prize at the 11th International Church Chief Violin Competition in Naples, first prize in the Young Artist Competition of the National Federal Federation of Music Clubs, and more re most recently, first prize from the Valsicia Musica International Violin Competition in Milan. We also have Pierre Baudry, who is a um, native of Quebec, and performs around the world. His extensive career has taken him to Europe, North America, China, and Southeast Asia. And he is lauded as an incredible musician who is a laureate of the international music competition of Finale, Finale Lugier in Italy. And he has received many grants from the Quebec Arts Council as, and is a DAAD alumni. We also had Elizabeth Mann, who is a long-term friend of the Sound and Specific Competition. He is a, she is a chamber, solo, and orchestral musician. She is principal flute um, with the Grammy Award-winning Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, as well as a member of the Pulitzer Award-winning Ensembles, adjudicator, guest principal flutes of with New York Phil and Boston Symphony. She has a lot of accolades as well. And last but not least, uh, Oh, not last at all. We have also Daniel Ihaj, who is uh, who earned a Master of Music degree in Performance and Literature from the Eastman School of Music, along with a prestigious Performance Certificate. And he is he was a voice member, a vo member of the voice faculty at the State University of New York at Fredonia, and has achieved the full rank of full professor. We also have James Welch, who is the brains and the um, heart behind Progressive Musicians. He is known as the piano soloist, chamber musician, conductor, and instructor of piano at Sunny uh, Fredonia. He is he was a prize winner in many competitions including the John Pierce Langs and Bradshaw and Bruno International Competition and is a really passionate judge who is a wonderful supporter and friend of ours. We also have to thank, um, not the judges now, but also supporters such as Bill Siegfried and Digital Island Studios, uh, in particular, Will Salvin and Max Bolton. So we are really privileged to have these people. And now Dr. Anna is gonna give even more shout outs to these people. Absolutely. Uh, we are extremely grateful to everyone who joined our hands together with us in producing these events at um, uh, Carnegie Whale Recital Hall and uh, special shout outs to um, Adler Ox Music Library, to our World Piano Teachers Association for their incredible support in uh, spreading the word and inviting musicians um, to participate in these events. Uh, we are very grateful to um, Piano Piano Rehearsal Studios for providing the facilities for rehearsals and uh, for practicing for musicians who um, came to New York to perform. Uh, we are very grateful to John K. Buff Cello School for supporting our programs and um, bringing incredible musicians on stage. And thank you very much for new, to New Media Productions and the director of it, um, Steve Robinson, for participating in our programs and taking incredible interviews with musicians, which we will see shortly. Thank you all very much. And uh, we also want to give a very special shout out to iClassical Academy for providing uh, incredible prizes and recognition awards to the finalists, to participants, and of course to the laureates of those editions. iClassical Academy is a Swiss-based um, educational company which provides the highest caliber uh, materials and educational um, opportunities for musicians who are studying music, uh, for especially for very serious uh, musicians, and they are very well known and very very well regarded for the incredible quality of their uh, courses and other materials which they provide. And uh, they supported nearly uh, $6,000 worth of awards which they have given to um, our laureates.
laureates, winners, and participants. Thank you very much, everyone to, who helped us uh, make this an incredible event and an enriching experience to our musicians. Well, we can't no matter where you are or who you are, music connects us all. We started with a dream, but now we are paving the future. Welcome to the Sound Espressiva Global Competition. Fully virtual, yet bringing musicians closer together than ever before, now on a global scale. True live, inclusivity, diversity, connection, community, an extraordinary array of judges. Get noticed by companies all over the world. Prizes, scholarships, performance opportunities. Apply to be a part of the most exciting congregation of artists like nothing you've ever seen before. We guarantee quality and leave no musician behind. We can't wait to hear you on the virtual stage. Well, I'm going to bring Hi. you back, Dr. Anna, because we didn't get to see your face and we just heard <laughs> you talk and we want to give you a special shout out as well because you were an integral part in making all of this happen. You are not only the brains and the heart behind it, but every effort, blood, sweat and tears uh, that went into this, you were behind it. So we're really privileged and proud to have you as not only the co-founder of concert, Virtual Concert Halls and Sound Espresso Competition, but being such an amazing supporter of musicians around the world who came to perform in Carnegie Hall. Big oh, thank you, to Chris, you. Thank very you. much. <laughs> and thank you everyone for your support and for joining our um, endeavors and our initiatives. Um, it, something like this can only be done through an incredible vibe and energy of a large community. And our community is very large and it's growing. And I'm so proud to see so many more musicians, teachers, performers, and other supporters, of the corporations, companies, producers joining us, joining this movement, this momentum of um, building bridges, building mm -hmm. connections and doing things together. I love that. Thank you yeah, all very much no. for your love. And Chris, you're an incredible host. Thank no, you for hosting me today. No, my pleasure. Like, look, and before I let you go and before I introduce Steve Robinson, I'm going to ask you one quick question, which I think is very important. Why Carnegie Hall? And uh, what was it like to be back? Uh, how did it feel to be in New York and surrounded by musicians and top level artists? How did it feel to be back in Carnegie? It felt fabulous. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it was incredible. I mm -hmm. love that stage. That's one of the my most favorite concert halls in the entire world. I love its size. I love its acoustics, the vibe, even the smell of the old wood. And mm -hmm. even though this time I wasn't playing that fantastic piano on stage, I still felt like we're back at home. And I love that we can have in-person concerts now in our favorite most beloved um, venues and combine it with connecting with people all over the world through the virtual. And one more thing, I want to bring in James Welch for a little quick question. Uh, without James and his incredible energy, this would not have happened. He Absolutely. was the one who arranged all of that around the Carnegie Hall and it was just Nora's James. Thank you for yes. your support and for your incredible energy and your optimistic spirit and your problem solving skills. <laughs> oh, you're well, you're very welcome. I mean, I, I can say the same to you. I mean, it, it, it's just, I mean, th this wouldn't have happened the way that it did without all of your creativity, your support and all of your skills. So uh, it, it's, it, it's been a real pleasure um, co-producing this with you and your team. Thank well, you, James. That's been quite an, a, quite an honor and quite a journey. <laughs> and James, before uh, I want to ask you a quick question too. I want you to tell us about your Carnegie Hall experience and because you got to perform and play, um, in, on stage as well. What was it like to be back and to have that experience to be on stage and to play and be in that special space? Well, you know, I mean, looking back, I mean, it was great in the moment, um, just producing and playing at the same time. Um, it just kind of like went real fast. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it it it, it 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 took me a little while after to, for it to sink in. And like, wait a minute. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm back here. I'm playing in Vial for Recital Hall again. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I'm playing with these amazing uh, violinists uh, that that are. I mean, it was just really the experience of a lifetime to be up there with these two kids. <laughs> I mean, that were just... And one of them um, came from all the way from India. Yeah, uh, Antia Dias uh, was from 
India. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, the quick backstory about her, she, two years ago, more than that, was in our first competition, right as COVID hit. She applied, and she won as a silver uh, medalist winner. And then we got delayed, and we got delayed, and then she got delayed because of, you know, COVID restrictions and all that. And we were finally able to bring her in, you know, two and a half years later, and, like, five times the violinist that she was back then, which was still amazing back then. But, I mean, it was it was such a journey for her to be there, and it was a pleasure to finally... Yeah, and it's all everyone. thanks to, you know, your work, James and, and Anna, putting all this together make, and believing in the fact that these events are important for musicians and never stopping to believe, be, never stopping to be, be, be in belief of that because we need to provide opportunities for performers to perform on stage and what better stage than Carnegie Hall. So we're really mm-hmm. grateful to you and... Um, Let's move on with the show, shall we? Yes. yes. Okay, so I'm going to introduce Steve Robinson and then we're going to have some performances and other things going on so you know um, you get to hear music, right? Enough of us talking. This is shows about music and interviews and the musicians themselves. Steve Robinson, who you're going to see a lot of, is our primary and amazing interviewer who has collaborated with us for as long as Sound Dispute Studio has been around. He is a veteran. To radio. He is a 50 year radio veteran who has produced programs from classical music documentaries to public affair programs and has directed over 100 on air pledge drives. I worked with him recently on the UNICEF pledge drive, and he is such a beast with putting all these things together and making sure that not only are the arts, but the government and everybody important main role players within the government and politics are participating in pledge drives and art. He co-founded the AIR, which is the Association of Independents in Radio, a service organization to assist independent radio producers in the U.S. He has produced shows that have been broadcasted all over the world, including Salzburg, Austria, Durban, South Africa, Quebec City in Canada, Jerusalem, Israel, and has produced numerous live broadcasts from Chicago and throughout the U.S., in 2015, he executed a cross-cultural broadcast relationship between America and China by exporting to China for the first time broadcasting concerts by the New York Philharmonic, LA Philharmonic, San Francisco Symphony, Dallas Symphony, Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center, and Carnegie Hall. And projects like this is what's going to create synergy between cultures as well as, hopefully, world peace. He has arranged for concerts from the Shanghai Spring International Music Festival and the Shanghai Symphony Orchestra to be exported to the West with broadcasts in the US, Canada, and Europe. So it's a cross-cultural synergy that's not just one end, it's two ends. There's a two-way highway between uh, countries as big as America and China and with culture, arts, music, and great music as the medium. We're really, really happy and proud to have Steve Robinson support us so greatly. So we're really pleased. He took the whole day uh, on the Carnegie Hall Concert Laureate Gala Day to interview every single musician. You're going to hear performances as well as interviews in person. And so without further ado, we're going to start with our first clip, right? And uh, our first clip of part two, obviously, is Rulitsa Sholokova, who is a violist. Uh, she plays A Prayer for Peace in 2022 uh, by Evelyn Strobach. And here is an interview between her and Steve Robinson. Enjoy. Rulitsa, welcome to Carnegie Hall and the Wild Recital Hall. You'll be performing this evening. Yes. But before we talk about the piece you'll be playing, which is quite special, uh, tell us a little bit about your career. You're a violist, and you are from? Originally from Bulgaria, Uh but uh, I lived in Canada for a very long time, Uh actually longer than I lived in Bulgaria. Uh And um, I, in fact, play both violin and viola because last not last week, but eight days ago, I was performing Vivaldi Four Seasons in Ottawa with orchestra in uh, like local 
chamber orchestra in the city. Uh-huh. Well, that's written for violin, not viola. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you play both. I play yeah, both. Yeah. And did you begin playing when you uh, before you left Bulgaria? Oh, yeah. Um, I was six uh, and I was born in a communist country. So at that time, uh, we had uh, specialized uh, schools where if you have talent and they see that you're gifted, they put you in such a school. So I was there from really early age of six. Um, and uh, I graduated there, then I went to study in Vienna, and then uh, I uh, went in Canada because I had a scholarship of $10,000. Mm-hmm. That was uh, like uh, 25 years ago. <laughs> and where in Vienna did you study? In uh, Hochschule für Musik und Darstellen in Kust at, at that time. Now it's the university. It was actually the school in Austria to study. So you were studying violin and viola? Yes, or? Uh, yeah. Actually, it was mandatory to play viola for a year, and this is how I learned to play viola there. Um, and it's a beautiful instrument, like with a great sonority, and um, occasionally uh, I perform pieces uh, on the viola, and uh, quite often uh, Canadian composers write pieces for me mm-hmm. uh, to perform. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Yeah. That's a great honor to have a composer write a piece for you. Yeah, they're very yeah. excited that I can play double stops. <laughs> <laughs> I'll uh, tell you about a piece you probably don't know, written by a person I used to know. Uh, his name is William Schumann. Do you know the name? I know the name. Do you know his viola concerto? No, I don't. It's one of his best pieces, in my opinion. Oh, okay. And it's called The Concerto on Old English Rounds for Viola, Orchestra, and wait for it, Women's Chorus. Oh, wow. So you must uh, find that piece. I will. I will. <laughs> because uh, he wrote it, um, he, it was commissioned by William McGuinness, uh-huh. if you know the name. Yeah, yeah, I know the name as well. And um, I, I interviewed, I did a portrait of, of Schumann, and I asked McGuinness about it, and he said, well, uh, Schumann said, well, he came up and played for me. Of course, Schumann knew the viola. And a couple of months later, he called him up. He said, uh, uh, I have good news and bad news. I'm going to write the piece but it's going to use a women's chorus. Ah, right. <laughs> so uh, his, uh, Schumann's great pal Lenny uh, Bernstein recorded it, mm-hmm. and d- then it disappeared. Oh. So I expect you to track it down. I will, I up. will. I was actually looking uh, for a virtuoso viola piece, so probably this is uh, quite a virtuoso one. And yeah. uh, yeah. the only one that I found was by Viotan, uh, a caprice that's uh, dedicated to Paganini. Uh-huh. Um, so... Well, I would definitely. And it's not it. so difficult to find a women's chorus, is it? <laughs> well, I don't know. In Canada, everything is a, Good. like according to a budget, if the budget allows. <laughs> so then you then you move to Canada, and um, it's a, we we talked about the your, the notes here talk about one CD, but apparently you've made quite a few. Uh, yeah, I have uh, five CDs, and actually I'm working on currently on one, which is with uh, violin concertos by Canadian women composers. Um, I uh, unfortunately, because of COVID, it was uh, a little bit interrupted. I did perform um, the first violin concerto composed by a Canadian composer um, in a concert tour I went to in Chile three years ago. And um, uh, this is one of the pieces that I'm going to be recording. And uh, uh, the other one is going to be a piece by Estonian Canadian composer. Uh, She uh, actually is going to be writing the first a uh, violin concerto by Estonian composer uh, um, uh, for me. And uh, uh, yeah, so the, she already started, so I hope she's going to finish soon. That's exciting. So uh, what label are these uh, CDs on? Oh, they are going to be under Center Disc, which is a Canadian music center label. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so um, hopefully next year I'm going to be able to record them and um, they're going to be released. Terrific. And you, on your next CD, you'll play the Schumann concerto. No, <laughs> but take a look at it, really. Now, tell us a bit about the piece you're playing tonight, because it's, was this piece also written for you? Tell us a bit about the composer. Uh, yes, Evelyn Strobach is uh, uh, like a really good uh, friend, and uh, I performed her pieces in the past. Um, she wrote a piece for solo violin for me that I premiered at the Ottawa Chamber Festival maybe 10 years ago. Uh, she also um, uh, wrote a piece for my CD, Aboriginal Inspirations, uh, which is the one that... Um, was recorded with Ron Corp, who is once again nominated for a Grammy. And uh, he was playing uh, playing, uh, native flutes uh, in that one. Um, And uh, this piece she wrote uh, for solo viola. It has three movements. I'm going to be playing uh, two of them. Uh, The first um, is um, uh, uh, the, the first and the second, and uh, uh, it is uh, the piece is dedicated um, to actually or not really dedicated, but it's, it's her desire to see peace in Israel, 
because it's a country that has been going through war and all kinds of turbulence uh, over the, I don't know. It's maybe. about peace in Israel, you said. Yeah. The, the, the feeling of the peace. Yes, exactly. That everything. Uh, is she Israeli? Um, no, but uh, she has the heritage, like the Jewish mm -hmm. heritage. And again, her name is Evelyn Strubach. Her actual heritage is uh, Dutch, Dutch. Uh, to be more precise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and tell us a bit about the piece and the sound of it. Is it uh, what, what style would you say? Is it tonal or? Oh yeah, it is definitely tonal. Um, it is um, uh, well, um, uh, like the the first uh, movement is called the desire of the heart. So it's uh, you can feel the pain and stuff, uh, like uh, how like. Uh, um, you would like to uh, um, uh, not, not see any suffering or anything mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. just everything to be peaceful. And it's really a very calm piece. And, but there is a little bit of drama, of course. And uh, uh, like uh, the, um, which comes throughout the first movement and the second as well, actually the most. Um, so the second movement is called an argument. And um, it's uh, the argument comes exactly in the climax of like in the middle of the second movement. Um, and um, well, I hope that the audience is going to feel uh, all those um, uh, emotions that she puts into the uh, piece and uh, from my performance and uh, like the piece. It's, um, uh, I have to say, uh, beautiful if it's played really well. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing it. Oh, thank you. And hearing your performance. And thank you for coming by. It's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah, likewise. Good luck. <laughs> thank you. Well, we're really pleased to be able to have Relitska Shulakova perform in Carnegie Hall for us this piece by A Prayer, uh, a prayer for Peace, uh, written in 2022 by Evelyn Strobach. And I think it's a testament to our musicians who aren't only playing uh, pieces in the, written in the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th century, but also in our 21st century. And it's really important that these pieces are heard, especially in a big stage like Carnegie Hall, where music ought to be heard um, around the world, obviously, but in, in a special place like that, I think it holds a very beautiful place in people's hearts to hear new music, uh, newly composed music that really touches the heart. Next up, we have an incredible ensemble, a cello ensemble, to say the least. Uh, they're called the Bows Lightly, and they're part of the Karboff Cello um, and it's headed by Alex Kirby and John Karboff. We're going to hear uh, their interview with Steve Robinson right now. And please enjoy this interview. And we're very pleased to have with us uh, representatives of the Bow Lightlies. Now, that's a cello ensemble, which was founded in 1992 by John Kiboff. Uh, and John is here with us. John, uh, you are a distinguished cellist in your own right. You studied with Janusz Stocker at Indy University. Um, tell us a little bit about your early career and, and uh, how you started on cello and wound up studying with one of the greatest cellists of all time. I started on cello because I was inspired by an orchestra concert that I went to to hear Leonard Rose play Dvorak Concerto and thus began my cello playing career at the age of 10. And then I went to Indiana University, and shortly after graduating, I ended up in Washington, D.C., and have been teaching cello there for 27 years. And to me, one of the most important things is chamber music or cello ensemble music. And the greatest joy is to play with others and to teach kids to play with others because the most important thing for these students is to have a hobby for the rest of their life. Let's rewind a little bit to the Leonard Rose concert. You, you, you hear him do the Dvorak, you're only 10 and something struck you, and you know, that was a few years ago, so maybe the memory isn't totally clear, but what was it? The soul of his cello just sort of exuded and went into the audience, and it sort of engulfed you and gave you shivers, or gave me shivers. And believe it or not, I was fired from my piano teacher shortly before that, and I wanted to try something new. So you were studying piano and said, nope, Yep. I think this instrument's a bit, it, it spoke to you. It was much more me. And from the moment I took my first cello lesson, I never looked back. I see. And what was it like working with Starker? How many years were you with Janusz Starker? I was with Mr. Starker for three years. It was, for me, the greatest experience of my life. 
He was tough, he was critical, but he was fair and kind and very direct and always made you think harder and more outside of the box than what you were doing. Mm -hmm. And you've obviously given recitals, you've I'm sure played concertos yourself with various orchestras, but you decided in 1995 when you were in your 20s to form this ensemble called Bo Lightly's. Uh, what was the inspiration for that? When I moved to Washington, D.C., I started teaching pre-college level, and I've always loved playing cello duets, and I wanted to get my students to enjoy this as early as possible. And even when I would have a little six-year-old playing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, I'd go to school with them, I'd play duets, and one by one, the ensemble started to grow. And by 2000, I had a huge studio of 35 students, eight of whom were lucky enough to play with Yo-Yo Ma at the World Cello Congress. And it's, to me, it's the most important thing. So the Bo Lightleys are a cello ensemble, um, and they're playing as eight, is it eight cellists in the ensemble, or does it vary? Tonight, it varies. It depends on who's in the studio at any given time. Tonight, there will be 13 cellists plus myself, and they range in age from eighth grade to 11th grade, and I have two wonderful, very young colleagues who are joining us, who are in their very beginning of their teaching career. And I've had as many as 16 or 17 kids. About a decade ago, we performed at the French Embassy in Washington, D.C. on one of their concerts. And there's nothing better than hearing the sound of a dozen plus cellos come together. Now, one of your students is Alexander Kirby. Alexander, you're a junior? Yes. In Maryland? Uh, McLean, Virginia, just outside of D.C. I see. And uh, when did you pick up the cello? When I was three and a half years old. Wait a minute. You can't play the cello when you're three and a half. It was the size of a violin, but yes. But it actually yes. played it as a cello. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard of that. And so what, uh, I mean, wh why the cello was, <laughs> instead of the, it was the size of the violin, why the cello? What, what, what inspired you? Do you remember um, that far back? My mom played the cello. She picked it up as an adult amateur. And music, it's kind of a family thing. My dad plays the guitar. They both wanted me to start something, but my mom kind of chose it for me. I was too young to actually know which instrument to pick, so she just picked it for me. And I see. Uh, but then the cello started getting bigger and bigger because yes. you kept growing up and you kept with it, uh, and you kept studying. Um, and when did you get your first teacher? Were you, did your parents teach you at first? Um, no, I started with Mr. Kaboff 13 years ago. Yes, that's my wow. very first lesson. Wow. How was he as a teacher? Is he any good? He's, he's decent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you heard that he was very inspired by, by Starker, and I'm sure you've heard Starker's recordings. Yes. Um, but he's obviously quite inspirational uh, to you. What, what, what about him has kept you inspired and involved? Well, when I was younger, I wasn't as involved, but as I've matured, I never really understood when I was younger. As I've matured, I've definitely grown for the love of the cello, and my Kabe, Mr. Kabuff has definitely helped me with that. He was a little bit rough on me in the beginning, but it definitely shaped me a little bit, and it did help me grow to love it. Uh -huh. It's one of my favorite things right yeah. now. Yeah, uh, rough on you in what sense? I mean, what, um, what, what was he uh, urging you uh, to do the most? Practice, that's the big <laughs> thing with little kids. He just wanted to play, but yeah. He says it's also very, you need the parents to be involved too, because without the parents, the kids don't practice, and then we don't play good, we won't improve. Right. And so uh, you joined the uh, Bo Lightleys and you've performed with them. What was it like uh, performing? Uh, was it with Yo Yo Ma or was Yo Ma Yo Yo the coach? Or? Um, That was way before me, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. You, Bo Lightleys played with Yo Yo in 2000, so that's 22 years ago. I see. Yeah. Those kids, some of them are professionals today, actually, and some of them have now become parents themselves and are doing music with their own children. Uh -huh. And what was the experience with Yo-Yo like? Because Yo-Yo was one of the most fantastic people in the world, so I'm sure he, he would inspire anybody 
<laughs> to do anything. He is absolutely like? one of, if not the most fantastic persons in the world. To me as a younger teacher, because I was 29 at the time, it was inspirational to say, this is exactly what I'm doing with my life and this is the right thing. And hearing him talk to the kids, being so kind and gentle and make teaching them to listen to each other. As I was conducting the cello ensemble, he kind of pulled me away during our rehearsal and made the kids listen to themselves. And at the time, the kids were between eight years old and 12 years old. So it was quite interesting to watch really young kids now do this without a conductor. How did you feel when he pulled you away? Uh, was he teaching you something as well? I think so. And probably to stand back and let the group kind of guide itself, whether it be musically or rhythmically. And it was something that I've actually taken with me since then. So sometimes when we rehearse, I will say, keep playing, and then I stop playing, and I sort of walk to the end of my room and listen to the kids, and I see how they're interacting with each other, whether it's looking at each other's bows to figure out the timing and coordination of rhythmical things, or musically, if they're breathing with each other, have they done the rallentando or the ritardando, the slowing down of a phrase together the way I was teaching them, and are they watching the other players to see if someone has the more melodic part, are the accompanying parts listening to the solo parts, and are the solo parts listening to the rhythmical section thinking, I've got to fit with their pulse. So it was quite a good pedagogical experience for me to learn how to, once I've given them their tools, have them implement it themselves. Uh -huh. Have you ever uh, had a performance with, without a conductor uh, in front of an audience? I, they've performed without me in the center, and so tonight I'm going to be playing as part of the ensemble. I will conduct a little bit at the very beginning of each piece, but once we set it going, it's conductorless. I see. Like chamber music, for yeah. example. Now, what about the repertoire? What what uh, is there much repertoire written for mass cellos? There is an incalculable amount of repertoire for mass cello ensemble. There are many amazing cellists uh, who have orchestrated uh, pieces like Dance Macabre, which we'll be playing tonight. And it's very readily online. As you can purchase it, you can get it as free scores. And the music is amazing. So the Dance Macabre you're playing tonight by... Camille Sanson. Camille Sanson. So it's, it was arranged for, for cello ensemble. It's arranged for 10 cellos. And so there'll be 13, 14 of us playing, including myself. And so uh, a couple of the parts will be doubled, of course. But there's uh, t basically for cello dectet. And the, uh, the arrangement is amazing. And if someone is familiar with the orchestral version, they'll sort of hear, oh, here's the harpist playing at the beginning. Here's where the violin plays their solo um, towards the end. And various cellists will be taking those roles. And of course, you've played the Bacchianus Brasileiros. Is it number five for cello and soprano? I have played that, yes. And the w number one is also amazing, too. Yeah. yeah, one of my favorite pieces. How many cellos have, is that scored for? I, I forgot. I believe it's also 10. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. But there's also, you say, a great deal of music written for, uh, original music written for 10 cellos or groups of cellos. I think, so the Bacchianus, of course, is written for cello. Right. Most of the mass cello ensemble music is transcribed I from see. something else, yeah. whether it be Bach Chacon, for example, right. or oh. uh, pictures at an exhibition. I have an ensemble for that. Uh, the Barber of Seville Overture I, I played with my students. Tonight, also, we're playing Themes from Schindler's List, which is written for cello quintet. Oh. And so uh, there'll be two to three per part, and it's quite amazing. And if you listen to the original soundtrack with Itzhak Perlman, it's beautiful on violin, and it has its own color there. And then when you have 14 cellos come together, it's a completely different color trying to send the same message. Mm -hmm. So it's important for us as musicians to learn how to speak. Okay, I'll leave you with this challenge. Now, I don't know what your budget is or where you get your funding, but uh, what you should do, and I'm sure it's you've occurred to you, is commission. You should commission. Have you commissioned any pieces? I have not yet, but one of my students who's in high school is dabbling with composition, and later this year we will be playing one of her pieces in Knoxville, Tennessee, at the Tennessee Cello Workshop at the University of Tennessee. So go in and find a patron, have them give you 
twenty thousand, let's say, and you can for twenty thousand you commission any 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 composer in the land who'd be thrilled. That would be amazing. Yeah, I can recommend my friend Alex Shapiro, wonderful uh, uh, composer. She's terrific. Would jump at the chance, as would anybody. Jennifer Higdon. You you can't name anybody who wouldn't jump at the chance, and it's not you know, and, and unfortunately for them, it's not that expensive. Right. No, that would be amazing. That, so that would absolutely be amazing. That's your assignment, and I will uh, expect a report in the next few months to With see pleasure. if I did. Okay. Alexander and John, thank you very much, and good luck tonight. I'm, I, I love the cello. I, I told you I, I dabbled with it uh, with uh, Stephen Gaber when I was in college, but uh, I, I wanted to learn how to do it just because I love it so much. It didn't get very far, but uh, I love it, and I'm looking forward to tonight very much, so good luck. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Welcome back, everybody. If you're just joining us now, we are presenting part two of our Carnegie Hall Laureates Gala uh, special. This is part two of interviews with musicians conducted by the amazing Steve Robinson, who you just heard from. And also we have clips from the rehearsals, clips from performances that we would love to present to you. This is an incredible experience for you to see not only the stories and the background behind these musicians. We just heard from um, uh, 
John Carboff and his uh, inspiration was uh, listening to Leonard Rose play the Dvorak Concello Concerto and then since then he has worked with Janos Starka and also have performed with Yo-Yo Ma and all of these kind of experiences add up and so the next generation of musicians get influenced and inspired by these sort of experiences. And speaking of ex- inspiration, performing in Carnegie Hall itself is an incredible inspiration and source of motivation for musicians to do so. And we just heard uh, Alex Kirby play with the New York Chamber Players, conducted by Maestro Giacomo Franchi. And there you see an incredible joy in the music playing because they know that there's something beautiful to look forward to. And we also have Piano Piano to thank you, uh, to thank for hosting the, the orchestral rehearsals that we could live stream for everybody to enjoy. So there's a lot of work and a lot of amazing people behind the scenes who have made this happen, especially the organization Sound and Perceiver Competition, especially virtual concert halls, as well as progressive musicians, and uh, to say none the least, the amazing musicians of the New York Chamber Players and Maestro Giacomo Franchi. And with that, we're going to move on to the next little clip that we have, speaking of Giacomo Franchi, who we're going to listen to. Uh, he's, there's, there'll be an interview and there will also be a rehearsal clip. So please enjoy Giacomo Franchi with the New York Chamber Players, uh, an interview as well as a rehearsal clip. We're delighted to have Giacomo, the conductor of the New York Chamber Players Orchestra, and a board member, Alex, joining us for this last interview we're doing uh, before the concert begins at 8 o'clock tonight. Mm -hmm. Giacomo, you have founded the group uh, in what year here in New York? Um, We started uh, the the group uh, first concert in 2004. Actually, we have had the the first concert right in front of Carnegie Hall. Uh, mm-hmm. There was a, a concert hall there called Cameo Hall, which was belonging to Columbia Artist Management. Then, uh, for several reasons, it didn't exist anymore. And uh, then I got into also the logistics of founding the orchestra and uh, organizing also the non-profit status by the year of 2008. I see. Uh, you know, you yourself are a pianist, and I'm in talking with you before this interview. You've made some extraordinary recordings of the complete piano music of Copland, Stravinsky, and now you're working on the 32 sonatas of oh, Beethoven. Beethoven. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and as part of your career as a pianist, you, what prompted you to found a chamber orchestra here in New York? Um, it, what happened is uh, I studied. Also uh, conducting uh, after the studying of uh, of uh, piano, of course, and uh, there was this title I had there. But uh, so conductor is a conductor if he has an orchestra. So, <laughs> so I I, f- I founded the orchestra uh, for that reason, uh, and that also fostered also my career as as concert pianist. Uh, and, and because then from then on I got more invitation as soloist with orchestra. Uh, and, and so forth and so on, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, how did you, uh, tonight you're performing, uh, apparently you're, you're accompanying 11 of the young soloists tonight, yeah. but also performing uh, the Bach. The, pia- the Bach Piano Concerto number five in F minor. And you're doing the whole, all three movements. Right. Yeah, yeah. And you'll be p- playing from the keyboard. Yes, I'll be con- conducting and playing, yeah. Yeah. Playing, yeah. Now, I've had an opportunity to interview all of the uh, performers today. We started at one, so we've been doing a lot of interviews. And I've been involved quite a bit in presenting young young musicians, and nothing um, that I've done actually gives me more satisfaction than putting together programs that involve these young kids. Because when I see and hear a six-year-old or a ten-year-old, whatever it is, performing, not only technically, I mean that's that's magic in itself, but so artistically. It, it never fails to move me very deeply, and I, I, I'm wondering what your reaction is to this. Well, uh, one of the main uh, points of the mission statement of the orchestra is fostering the career of very young, uh, ma- ma- very talented musicians. So we have been doing uh, 12 uh, editions of a concerto competition with the New York Chamber Players. So I've been in touch with this phenomenal kids for men for quite a few years and uh, it's it's always incredible the way their talent is and, uh, and I'm 
identifying with what I'm agreeing with what you yeah. say, yes. Yeah. It actually yeah. brings tears to my eyes, to tell you the truth, when I see particularly a, a younger person performing, but sensitively, not, right. not just... Yeah, also, also with expression, yeah, and, expression and, and musicality. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Alex, you're a member of the board. Yeah. Um, what uh, motivates you to help them? What you just said, uh, the value of helping young musicians. Um, so I have an interesting uh, connection with Giacomo. I um, decided to play piano five years ago, so I'm not a young player. <laughs> but uh, And... I discover him as a teacher, so he's my teacher, and I fall in love with the uh, idea of learning piano, and then he introduced me to the orchestra, and um, I could help a little bit financially, and so uh, Jacob offered me uh, very nicely to become a board member, and I really like the process. I like the idea of creating this uh, orchestra, of uh, helping uh, young players, and, demonstra and giving them access to an orchestra, which does, is pretty difficult. Yeah, so I've been involved with nonprofits my whole life. Mm. Um, written more grants than uh, and been re refused more grants. I could <laughs> paper my walls, as they say, with the rejection letters. So it's a very difficult process, but mm. uh, also quite rewarding, isn't it? Now, now you so you started piano five years ago from scratch. From scratch, I used to play violin when I was a kid, ah. and I stopped when I was twelve years old. I want to open a parenthesis here. So the. Uh, I, I've been doing uh, professional master classes with high level pianists, of course, but uh, a good core of my, of my activity as a teacher is uh, teaching piano as um, to uh, divulgate classical music to people that are interested in that they do other jobs but then they they get involved in classical music and you, you'd be surprised beside of course having them becoming a, a, a important uh, development for my orchestra also they start going to concert halls because there is more need of public than of mm -hmm. musicians mm -hmm. so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's how we develop an audience, um, which is f yeah. for this music. Yes. Uh, classical music is always dying, everybody says. It never, never does. I don't think so. It but. never does. No, no, it always <laughs> is there. And I, I'm finding that younger people are coming up uh, interested, and you can go to a concert these days, particularly opera, and see a much younger audience, and it's very gratifying. Where in New York do you perform? Well, uh, the the uh, orchestra. The orchestra usually uh, we are at the Menna Center, oh. uh, and uh, that's our home. Say that mm -hmm. we we re regularly perform there, and then on occasion we we go other concert halls. But in this last few years we have been there. It's, there is a concert hall within uh, the Menna Center called uh, Carry Hall, and we perform there. Mm -hmm. How many concerts do you give a year? Uh, it's between three and five, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. What kind of repertoire uh, do, do it, you... It's uh, usually traditional repertoire. Uh, sometimes we do also contemporary music. Mm -hmm. The last uh, concert we did uh, was uh, about contemporary music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I am looking forward tremendously to tonight because having interviewed all the, or most of the performers, I'm very eager to, uh, to hear them. I heard a little bit from the tape last night from the interview, but I'm, I'm very anxious to hear your, your Bach as well. It's one of my favorite concertos, actually, of the set. Okay. Alex, thank you. And thank thanks you. for your support of the orchestra. They, uh, it's people it's like you that, that make these, these ensembles very what rewarding. they are. Thank you. Thank you, Giacomo.
Welcome back. You just heard a clip of Giacomo Franchi with the New York Chamber Players performing a Bach piano concerto. And what a pleasure to hear that as well as his interview uh, alongside a board member named Alex, uh, who is a big supporter of the New York Chamber Players being interviewed by none other than the legendary radio broadcaster Steve Robinson. We have Piano Piano to thank. Uh, that was the venue in which you just saw the rehearsal at. We also have the Manhattan Club and uh, of course Steve Robinson and all his amazing technical uh, cameramen to capture these interviews for us to play for you. The amazing thing about virtual concert halls and sound receiver competitions as well as progressive musicians putting all stuff is that we get a lot of footage to use and to show you behind the scenes as well as a little snip uh, a snippet of what their lives are like and I really loved how during these interviews that Steve Robinson had, Robinson had with the musicians you get to hear about the value in helping musicians um, young musicians have a stage to perform in as well as their views on classical music is it dying is it not um, there are so many people who go to operas and different concerts and uh, smaller venues bigger venues and I think this uh, is really exciting for a lot of musicians overseas and even watching you get a sense that no classical music isn't dying there's a lot of future left and the future is in the young musicians so investments need to be made in the younger generation the next generation so that this music will be continued to be played especially an incredible composer Bach and um, yeah with that it's just it gives us a lot of hope so I hope you're inspired if you're catching us now we are on part two of our story the Carnegie Hall gala uh, for all the lorries of the auditions we want to tell you a little bit that there's going to be a part two also of the Carnegie Hall laureates gala and it's going to be happening in June 2023 and we can't wait for you to go watch the second part there will be different musicians all prize winners all excellent musicians and they are just so excited to be able to perform in a stage as amazing as Carnegie Hall and speaking of people performing in Carnegie Hall we have next Lucia Tang Lucia Tang is a pianist, a wonderful pianist, performing uh, the Concerto in D Major by Haydn. And she performed that in Carnegie Hall, and I'm sure she's going put, to be putting that on her resume for the rest of her life, uh, no matter whether she does music or not. And we're going to hear a little snippet of her meeting with the conductor, Giacomo Franchi. Uh, we're going to have her interview with Steve Robinson, and then some music for you to enjoy. So with that, take it away. Hi, Lucia. So if you just start from the beginning, see what kind of temp you do. example before that last scale that you play you know that there is an, an orchestra part uh, there so you have to wait a moment right yeah um okay uh another thing is when you play the sixteen notes uh especially uh, this from measure 39 there are a series of 16 notes it's better if you keep the tempi a little bit more seat so you are able to to play clear uh, yeah uh, can you just start again please from the very beginning then keep on going yeah. 
Carnegie Hall in the Wild Recital uh, Hall. It's beautiful to have you here. Thank you. And you are 10 years old. Yeah. And when, uh, how old were you when you started uh, first playing the piano? Probably like six or seven. So you've been playing three or four years. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what kind of progress have you made uh, in those three years? I, I, a little, a little person told me, a little birdie, as we used to say, that you've done pretty well uh, on those years. How's you? Uh, how do you feel about it? I feel like I improved a lot since the start, especially after I joined um, Miss Anna's piano place. So your teacher is uh, Anna Uspensky, huh? Yeah. And uh, Dr. Anna Uspen uh, Uspensky has organized this whole event. She um, arranged the competition. You played in a competition, one of the uh, Sound Espressivo competitions. Yeah. Uh, what piece did you play for that? Um, I played a Kowalewski and a Tchaikovsky. Kowalewski? Yeah. Which piece? Takatina. Wow. And uh, which Tchaikovsky piece? Um, it was a waltz. The waltz from, uh, was it from uh, the the seasons or just? It was just like a waltz for children. A waltz for children, I see. Yeah. And were you nervous when you had to compete? It, it was all, you did it at home because yeah. it was virtual, but you still must have been a little bit, was it pretty exciting? I was like excited, but also like really nervous because it was my first time at a piano competition. And look at you, here you are at Carnegie Hall. So you did well. Now, I understand that you like to compose. Um, or at yeah, least sing, sing while you're playing or think about singing while you're playing. Yeah. Have you actually composed too? Um, not really, but like I sometimes like to take pieces from online that are written for like a different instrument and then turn it into piano. I see. So you, you'll take a song that you've heard on the Internet and play it at the piano? And sing with it. Sometimes. I see, yeah. Well, maybe you'll... Um, uh, and that's popular music. Or yeah. Not, not necessarily classical, but maybe you'll uh, sometime grow up and be a, a singer, a piano, a pianist and a singer, because it could be done, like Michael Feinstein, if you know the name. No. Don't know the name, yeah. Yeah. And um, what piece are you playing tonight? Um, Haydn's Concerto in D Major. Really? Um, and so with a piano accompanist? Uh, orchestra. Oh, you're doing it with the orchestra. Oh, my goodness. So that's a wonderful piece. Are you playing, what movement are you playing? Third. The third movement. Wow. That's a, that's a terrific piece. He didn't write many piano concertos, but that's, that's a, he, did, he did that one, I think. And it's a terrific piece. How long did it take you to uh, get it under your fingers? Um, about, like, t three months. Three months. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is it a what, what sort of tempo do they take on it? Is uh, it a pretty pretty brisk tempo or? It's moderate. Moderate tempo, so you can um, get through it. Okay. Yeah. Well, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's um, how beautifully you phrase it and how you make it sound and getting all the phrasing right. It doesn't really matter what the tempo is at all, as long as you play it uh, with musicality. Yeah, and. You're um, in, what grade are you in? Sixth. And do you think you'll keep at the piano? Probably, yeah. Yeah, but you have other interests, though. What are some of your other interests? I do rhythmic gymnastics, ballet, and creative writing. Oh, that's right. I read that. You're a gymnast. Yeah. And I understand you've placed uh, in some competitions. And what, what kind of um, tumbling, what sort of, not tumbling, but what sort of uh, routines do you do? Um, so in rhythmic gymnastics, it's not like artistic. So we have ball, hoop, clubs, ribbon, floor, and rope. And this year I'm doing ball, hoop, floor, and clubs. And like you, you do a routine with music and it has like dance incorporated in it and like flexibility stuff and like, um, equipment things as well. And do you, that you practice a lot for that, I'll bet. Yeah. I practiced more last year, though. Mm -hmm. And uh, how many, uh, you have, is it difficult finding time to practice the, uh, the gym and the piano? Yeah. How do you do that? Um, I normally practice 
practice, I try to practice piano as much as I can, like every day. And for gymnastics, I just do it on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, sometimes Thursday. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and sometimes those three or four days a week. Yeah. So you're a busy young lady. Um, and, uh, well, I wish you the best in your piano career. Uh, look forward to the concerto tonight. It's one of my favorite concertos, so I'll be listening very closely to that. And maybe someday I'll see you out on the um, at a gym performing. So thank you very much for coming by. Thank you. Good meeting you. Got to get a picture. Wow, that was an incredible performance. And it's so interesting to hear uh, even 10 year olds being interviewed. It's not often you get um, to hear the voice of um, a 10 year old expressing all these different interests from rhythm gymnastics uh, to creative writing and to music, obviously. And she has such a in-depth knowledge of what she likes and what she doesn't like, and she speaks so well. Um, so I hope you really enjoyed that interview with Steve Robinson. I feel like a lot of time we don't give enough credit to uh, these young kids who are able to express themselves so well. And speaking of these young kids, uh, we're going to bring on stage Dr. Anna Ospensky, who is the teacher of Lucia Tang. Let's bring her on. Hello. <laughs> Thank <Yes>. you, Chris. <laughs> yeah, congratulations on your student playing so lovely and so well. Uh, and, Thank you. Yeah. My gosh, this makes me so nervous even just watching the video. I thought I was yes. going to die being um, <laughs> nervous for, for these kids. And, you know, the best part is to watch them grow and um, enjoy the growth and enjoy the mm -hmm. um, stress and experience and all yeah. of that. Um, the worst part is I want to jump in and play instead of them. <laughs> yeah. It's just yeah. so nerve wracking. <laughs> yeah. But Lucia did a fabulous job on that concert and she only worked on the piece for three months. I'm so proud of that little girl putting her entire being into preparing yeah. and doing well, this. You've made, you've made her music life already you know to play in Carnegie Hall concerto with orchestra uh, on one of the biggest stages and the most important stages in in the world you've you've done that and so congratulations to you um, thank you um, it's it's amazing these kids so, are amazing to work with you know they have a character when mm -hmm. she was auditioning she was auditioning for both the concerto and the solo uh, and then I asked her Lucia if you don't make it as a uh, soloist with the orchestra. Uh, let's prepare the backup piece so maybe you'll make it as a mm -hmm. soloist. You know what she said? I will play with the orchestra. <laughs> okay! <laughs> well, the judges kind of have to decide that. And she yeah. said, I'll do my best. And yeah. she did. So it's, there we go. It's amazing. Uh, and you were there for the actual performance in Carnegie Hall. Tell us about that and how nervous were you for the real performance? I already said that. I was nervous as a rack. <laughs> And but but Lucia did a fantastic job, and so did Kate, so and so did Marcella. I don't know if we have the interviews with them. Later. Yeah, we'll have it soon. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think it's such a privilege for them to have a teacher who's not, not only so caring but able to organize these sort of events. Um, so kudos to you. All credit goes to you. And um, all credit goes to our community, Chris, to everyone, <laughs> you included, and the guys behind the scenes, and James, and everyone. You know, this is yeah. bigger than one person. This let's is... bring James on the stage. Let's bring James on. Yeah. 
yes. have a question for James. Oh, you have a question. Uh, I, I have Perfect. a question. Let's bring him on. Well, I've, my question is... Good luck, uh, James. Chris yeah. has a question to you. <laughs> I'm going to get nervous. Gonna <laughs> You're never going to never know what's going to happen. Uh, I want to ask you about the backstage experience. What was it like to be backstage? Were you nervous for the people? Were you able to hear and sit in the audience? What was it like for you to be in Carnegie and organizing everything? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, well, it, it, it was... It was amazing. It was chaotic and crazy, um, but it was amazing backstage. Um, you know, I think at one point we probably had about 40 people sitting in the small room backstage, yeah. including the orchestra, um, getting people shifted around and um, doing traffic control, bringing mm -hmm. them out to the crowd is to sit in the balcony, bringing them back in time to warm up and perform. Yeah. And it was, it, it, I, I called it the train station. Uh, we, we just kept yeah. the trains running. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. the trains were bigger than others. And mm -hmm. um, there were more passengers than others sometimes. Yeah. Um, but it, it was great. And I, you know, I got to listen from the stage door to all the glorious music. Yeah. And hear everybody play their absolute best. It, it was just an experience of a lifetime. Very overwhelming in the best way possible. I love it. And uh, you were sharing a story before about <laughs> the contestants. Can you tell us a bit about, yeah, tell us about Lucia. What happened during the, the rehearsals and your experience with these amazing young kids? You know, I, I, it, it's not too often, um, you know, just like in each town or each studio that mm -hmm. like you, you see like so many people like all together at once so mm -hmm. enthusiastic about what they're doing and just willing to take the um it, it raise the bar even yeah. um and what anna was saying about lucia actually didn't surprise me i didn't know that but um <laughs> so lucia and uh kate were both there almost the entire time and they came in mm. maybe shortly after the rehearsal had started and they they just come in and they look at me and they're like can we watch inside and i said well of course and i thought you know two, <laughs> How could you two say kids no? <laughs> they'll stay a few minutes yeah. they stayed there the whole time they were uh, like so into everything that was happening i mean mm -hmm. they weren't your typical squirrely kids and then we were short on space so they shared a chair and it was cute <laughs> that is amazing well thank you for sharing that it's these little stories that really make the whole experience wonderful and a really beautiful memory so thank you james for everything you've done to make thank all this happen i know there's a lot of behind the scenes work that doesn't get much credit uh, especially the schedules and chasing mm -hmm. people up and wondering where people are so thank you for that and making this as smooth as and beautiful as possible thank you chris you're welcome and with that we're going to move on to our next contestant uh who's he's a pianist and his name is zukai andy wang and during the gala he performed uh concerto number 12 k414 the allegro movement by mozart and with that uh we're going to turn to his some of his additions and some of his video playing but most importantly we're going to hear his interview with steve robinson enjoy
It's wonderful to have you here at Carnegie Hall. Have you ever been to uh, New York before? Um, no, this is my first time here. And where are you from? Um, I'm from Oakville, Canada. Really? And your first time in New York? Mm -hmm. Have you had a couple of days to look around the city? and? S yeah. And what do you really think? Um, I really like this place. There's like everything you want. Everything you want. That's true. Anything you want, you can get right here, including all kinds of different music. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, how old are you? Um, I'm nine years old. And you're a, a pianist? Yes. And how long have you been studying? Um, I've been studying for almost three years. I started when I was six. I see. And uh, whose idea was it that you would take piano lessons? Um, my mom, because she knows I'm a quiet person, and she wanted to find me a good way to express my feelings non-verbally. And I think she's right. Wow. Well, that was a beautiful thing your mom did. And now not every kid who is asked to study piano by their mom or their dad likes it. But you did like it. Yeah. What, and what did you like about it? Um, when I first heard the piano, I really liked the sound, and I was 100% sure that I would continue. That's great. And continue you did. And uh, what kind of, uh, how, how much, you, you made some pretty good progress. Did you study, uh, did you practice uh, about five or ten minutes a day? Um, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, each day I practice one to two hours, depending on my schedule. One to two hours? Wow. Yeah, but I stay really focused when I practice, so it's, so it's got really high efficiency, and that saves my time. I see, and what sort of practicing do you do? Do you, do you play the hand and exercises? Have you learned those? I do the, sc the scales and the churning etudes and, and that stuff. Yeah. Well, it's very interesting to hear you say that, that you're an efficient practicer because that's very, very important. Yeah. And so you, get the mo so you practice two hours a day, which is a long time for a, a, young, a young man like yourself, but, that's, but you're getting the most out of it that you can. And then what pieces did you start to play, um, actual compositions? Because you can't play scales all day long. Um, I also play the 12 variations of Mozart. Um, now I also play Sinfonia and Sonatas by Haydn and Sonatinas by Kuhlo. And also now I also practice the variations of Paganini. Really? Paganini? Difficult composer. Yeah. I used to play a Kulao piece. I practiced it forever, and I just could never get it right. So I had to move on to another instrument. But I admire you for sticking with that Kulao piece. Thank you. Yeah, I really liked it, but I just couldn't, didn't have what you would call the talent, which clearly you have. Um, now, what piece are you playing tonight? Uh, I'm playing Concerto in A Major by Mozart. Really? The A major concerto. Uh, what number is it? Do you remember what number that is? Number in? twelve, KV four and four. Four eighty four. Yeah. No, four four hundred and fourteen. Right. And um, are you playing one movement? Yeah, first movement. First movement. Mm hmm. That's fantastic. You know, of all of the sets of music in the world, whether it's Wagner operas or Bach, the Mozart piano concertos are my favorite. So I'm really going to be looking forward to your performance. Thank you. Yeah. And what is it about Mozart that you like? Um, I like Mozart's music because it's very clean, it's bright, and it's lively. And another good thing is that he doesn't need so much pedal, and that's a lot of less work. Yeah. A lot of people who don't really know music say, well, Mozart's easy to play. But it isn't, is it? It isn't. Yeah. Because it's really exposed. I mean, you have to get mm -hmm. everything exactly right. Yeah. I think I heard a tape of you. Did you do a rehearsal the other day? Yes. Yeah, I think I saw that. It was really beautiful. Thank you. And, of course, tonight you'll be playing it for real uh, in front of an audience, and I'm sure it'll inspire you. Have you played um, in front of audiences much before? I don't think I have. Really? So this is your first time? Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, I saw you on that tape the other night, and I know that you, you're going to be just terrific because you played with real confidence and um, bravado, and I'm sure you're just going to hit it out of the ballpark tonight. Thank you so much. And uh, as you look ahead, I know you're only nine years old, but uh, do you think you'd like to keep going with your music, or do you have other interests? Um, I don't really plan for the future, but now... I think I'm pretty happy with myself. I think I might continue because it's a good way of expressing my feelings because when I get to some really hard stuff in the future, I somehow might need to get all the fr frustration away. Terrific. So whatever you do, I think you're going to be very successful because um, you don't seem very shy to me. You seem very confident, and you express yourself beautifully, and I'm sure it's going to be a terrific performance tonight. I'll be there course and I'll be listening and I can't wait to hear you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well it's not every day you get such an insightful kid and uh, he's able to be aware that he's introverted but also that music is the medium in which he's able to express himself and not only um, his own emotions but also a way to channel out his so-called frustration uh, I'm really just admire this uh, immensely and I think what a privilege for us to be able to hear them speak on their love for music and what worked for them and their upbringing uh, we're so happy that Steve Robinson agreed to interview these contestants and these winners at the Manhattan Club and you heard just now his little clip of his performance uh, of the Mozart Concerto number 12, Kirkle 414 the, and, uh, by Mozart, and uh, his interview with Steve Robinson. This is such a pleasure. If you're joining us now, we are part, uh, halfway through our part two of our story, what happened at the Carnegie Laureate Scala uh, not very long ago, less than a month ago. And uh, this is a really beautiful opportunity to share with you not only their performances but also the behind the scenes uh, and the interview uh, with Steve Robinson which is really rare a legendary radio broadcaster interviewing the winners who are about to perform at the Laureates Gala we have many people to thank for that including Sound Espressivo Competition progressive musicians the New York Chamber Players and Giacomo Franchi as well as the Piano Piano Rehearsal Studios we have History of Music iClassical Academy uh, and the WT uh, WTP um, Association for all their hard work putting all this together. It is uh, as well as new media production and the Oaks Music Library. Coming up soon, we'll be announcing the winner of the James Adler Audience Award. And uh, look forward to that. That's going to be coming soon. James Adler is a very proud supporter of everything we do and he's such an incredible person to work with he previously was a judge and still uh, continues to judge but also is a fantastic musician and pianist who studied uh, at Curtis Institute uh, and what more beautiful award can we be giving out for this audience award so with that now we're going to move on to our next uh, person this is uh, a violinist that we are about to introduce. Her name is Annabelle Wei. We're going to hear uh, his, her, her meeting with the conductor, Giacomo, as well as her interview with Steve Robinson, and we'll finish off with a little clip of her playing. Please enjoy. Like, uh, if you can do the trill, uh a little bit, a little, not that fast. Um, pia, pia, too much. Uh, it, it's a little bit uh, le less fast, and, and so you will probably gain in clarity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
you, you have you have you have to measure. Uh, uh, so you so you, sta you, sta you start to measure four. So there are two of those. those. Start from the very beginning. Okay, and then continue. Here at Carnegie Hall, you'll be performing mm -hmm. tonight, and uh, you live in Maryland. Uh, no, Delaware. Oh, Delaware. Yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're here to perform what piece tonight? Um, I'm going to be playing Vivaldi's Four Seasons, but the winter for the first and second movement. I see. Now, I want to back up a little bit because I read in your bio that you won a contest and a competition when you were nine years old mm -hmm. and. Now you're, uh, how old are you now? Twelve. Twelve? Yes. And how old were you when you started playing the violin? Um, I was about to turn seven. Six so. and seven? Yeah. Well, if you picked up the violin when you were six or seven, how did you happen to be playing in a competition just two years later when you were nine? How, you um, must have progressed pretty fast. Um, I would say, um, like, in the beginning, I, I think I did pick up the instrument pretty quickly. But, yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, and you progressed. And what was it about the violin that um, uh, made you want to keep practicing? Because you, I'm sure you practice more than five minutes a day. Uh, yes. Um, I think I just, I liked how there's, like, like different, like, strings, and then you can use, you can just, like, use your fingers to, like, press on the notes, and then you have, like, a bow to just like make sound out of it and i i think i thought it was pretty fun like how you can make sound out of like a wooden little like toy sort of <laughs> and now the sounds you're making it's music and uh, it's, it, that's the whole point of it and mm -hmm. what is it about the music that you play that attracts you because you wouldn't have been practicing so hard unless you like that music what is it about the music that you like um i think i think i like how um, there's like the different strings. I think I like how the different strings have different um, tones almost and the different classical pieces. Um, I think like you can get very different characters out of the different pieces. 
And tonight you you said you're doing the Vivaldi? Uh, yes. W- which movement? The winter movement? Um, I'm playing winter first and second movement. You are? Yes. Yeah. Oh, w- backed up with, a, with an ensemble? Uh, yes. Yeah. Have you played the Vivaldi before? Uh, yeah. 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 And what other pieces are you working on? Um... Right now, well, more recently, I've been working on the Mendelssohn Concerto. Mendelssohn? Uh, yes. Really? Yeah. Do you think you'll perform that someday? Um, hopefully, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a wonderful piece. Yeah, I really like it. Yeah, it's probably one of the best-known violin concertos in the world. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you you like the way it sounds, and you like playing it. Mm -hmm. Um, Have you tried to play it through at home, just the violin part? Um... The first movement, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Have you heard other violinists on on record play it? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you have any violinists that that you find really interesting and inspirational? Um, I think I like Anne Sophie Mutter because um, I think she can like make any piece sound very expressive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now I also understand that you enjoy composing. Mm-hmm. Wow. And what sort of music are you composing? Um, usually just classical, just like, um, I, I wouldn't say it's like, it's very different like than like Mozart or Vivaldi or Mendelssohn, but um, it's near that sort of genre. And how do you think up the melodies? Do they just come to your head or do you, do you pick them out on the violin or the piano? Yeah, I think usually um, I'm just like, I'm just like playing around on violin and then I just start to like pick up a melody and I just like write it down. And are your pieces for solo violin or do you try to uh, write for other instruments? Um, usually just violin because I don't quite understand some of the other instruments. Well, it's starting with the, with the one instrument is very good. <laughs> so you can learn all about um, uh, how one instrument works and then maybe uh, the other string instruments or the similarity and then as you progress, maybe you'll learn um, other instruments, how to write for them. Yeah. You, and you like orchestral music? Uh, yes. Yeah, do you have any yeah. favorite symphonies? Um, not quite, but I just like how the orchestra all together sounds. Yeah, have you had a chance to go to many concerts? Um, yeah, I've gone to many of the Philadelphia orchestras. Philadelphia? Yeah, like um, just listening to their concerts. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty good orchestra. Mm-hmm. One of the best in the whole world. Yeah. 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 Really nice. And the sound in the hall is so beautiful, and mm-hmm. they'll play everything from Mozart to Beethoven to Mahler, right? Yeah. 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 You a big Mahler fan? Um, a little bit. Yeah, I've played um, like one of the symphonies at my um, during my like when I okay sorry I played one of the Mahler symphonies with my old. Orchestra. The orchestra, wow. Yeah. Do you remember which one? Was it number one, or do, do you remember? No. No, okay, yeah. I just remember it was Mahler. Yeah, Mahler is really a wonderful composer. And uh, what are your future plans? Uh, do you think you'll... Do you have other interests besides music? Um, well, I, I don't think I would, like... I'm not trying to completely drop out of violin. Um, I'm not completely sure yet. Um, you have a little time. Yeah. Good. Well, I wish you the best. I can't wait to hear the uh, Vivaldi tonight. I love Vivaldi. Yeah. Yeah, I love Vivaldi. Um, he wrote a lot of music, mm-hmm. a lot of music, yes, and he but he also wrote a lot of operas. People don't realize that he wrote. Uh, he actually wrote fifty operas, and and seventeen or eighteen are still survive. He's a very big opera composer as well as all the wonderful pieces he wrote for violin and lute, and he was terrific. So, I wish you the best tonight. I can't wait to hear you. Thank you. Good. Thanks for coming by. Thank you. Well, that was 12-year-old Annabelle Wei, who performed uh, Winter, uh, two, uh, two movements from the Vivaldi Concerto in F minor. And you heard a little bit of her performance, her meeting with Giacomo Franchi, the maestro who conducted the New York Chamber Players, and also an amazing and intimate conversation with Steve Robinson about her past, her growing up, what who she enjoys listening to. And uh, it's, it's amazing to get this kind of insight 
uh, from the musicians themselves. Uh, I hope you enjoy that. We also will be having a, another gala, part two the, of the Laureates Gala in June 2023. And I hope you'll tune in for that. We're going to have another big celebration uh, for these winners of the Carnegie Hall auditions. And everyone who has, uh, who has won gets to perform in Carnegie Hall. And what a privilege. Uh, so proud, supported by progressive musicians, uh, the New York Chamber Players, uh, Sound and Specific Competition, and you're watching this on an amazing platform that Virtual Concert Halls is able to utilize. We have an amazing tech directors and a wonderful team who is putting this all together. So I hope you're enjoying the show so far, and uh, there's more to come. Next up, we have Marcella Gonya, who is a pianist, and uh, she'll be performing Zukovsky's uh, Piano Concerto and uh, the Allegro Vivo movement and you'll get to hear a little bit of a, a snippet of a performance as well as her meeting uh, with Giacomo as well as the interview, another interview with Steve Robinson. So please enjoy and uh, coming up next, Marcella Gonya. I liked I liked a little bit better a little later than the beginning. The beginning was a little a little bit pushed, uh, but uh, I mean it was very good. Uh, okay, start again from the very beginning and then keep on going. Sala, it's great to have you here in Carnegie Hall. Uh, you're going to be performing tonight. Yes. Are you excited? Um, I'm excited. I'm nervous, but it'll be fun. <laughs> yeah. What are you playing? Um, I'm playing the third movement of Sergei Zubkowski's um, concerto. 
So. Who's concerto? Sergei Zukovsky. Don't know him. He's um, like a modern con- um, composer. So this is gonna be definitely a modern co- concerto and like unique. So that'll be fun. But, yeah. What What is the piece? Uh, tell us a little bit about what the piece sounds like and why you picked it. Um, I picked it because it's definitely like unique, like I said, and very quirky. It has many like loud chords and different like dynamics. It's quiet. And then it changes the loud very loudly, for very fast. <laughs> it goes from quiet to loud, like very fast, and um, it's really fun. It's um, quirky and unique. And so. how did you come across it? Was something maybe your teacher brought to your yeah. attention? Yeah. Um, so my teacher, she, her husband's um, father composed the piece, and she brought it to my attention. And Wait, your teacher's husband's, husband's father, father? Yeah. Sergei. Um, Zukovsky. Zukovsky wrote yes. the piece. Is he Russian? Um, I think so. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure, but... Have you met him? No, I haven't met him. He's still with us? Not sure, <laughs> but no. I don't think so. Right, right, right. That's exciting. So you're sort of keeping it in the family. Yeah. Yeah. So... Now let's wind up a little bit. You're about 15 years old. Yes. And you started playing when you were five. Yes. Yeah. And you've won some competitions. Um, yeah. Well, how did you progress so fast that, that you can start playing competitions? Um... Um, when I was five, I started practicing um, a lot of piano, and I got into it because my mom, because my memory was not the best when I was younger, so then my mom heard about instruments and how it can help you with your memory, so I started playing because of that. And I also started playing because in music class, they would have keyboards and we would play on them, and um, it was fun to do that, so then I decided to go like more into it, and then my mom found um, Miss Anna, and that's when I started practicing a lot more and started getting pieces that were a lot harder and I started getting pushed more and that's when I started doing competitions and yeah and then it started getting bigger and bigger until yeah now. We get it back up a little so you, your mom thought it would be a good idea to help with your memory. memory. Yeah because when you have to play music you have to memorize the pieces so and there's a lot of pages of music so you have to memorize all those pages and then perform it about the book and then that helps a lot so. So there you were uh, practicing <laughs> piano to help your memory, but yeah. clearly um, you went a little bit beyond that. Yeah. What about the music uh, became more than just a memory exercise for you? Um, it, like in the last two years, I started playing with my school orchestra, and that's when I like started. And also, I started playing with another pianist. So it was me and another pianist for the concertos because there's a second part, right. and that was more. That was really fun because I had a community of other people who also played instruments, and there was also the social aspect. And also, when I do play music, it's really fun because I like hearing the dynamics and the history piece is also cool. And, but yeah, but the community is pretty awesome part about it. Yeah. What sort of feelings uh, do you look for in music? And what, when you're playing, I've often wondered, uh, because I'm not a musician, Mm -hmm. uh, some of the music is so beautiful. uh, As a listener, you get carried away with it. Um, As a performer, how do you control that so you can get the yeah. notes, but at the same time uh, be moved with it? Um, so for the piece that I'm playing, I've been practicing it for a very long time. So I, I'm kind of used to the sounds of it, unlike the audience, who's it's their first time listening to it. So when I'm playing it, I just got to remember to really be dramatic with my movements, like show like all the different dynamics that there are, and like when it's forte slam the keys and when it's um, <laughs> piano lighter and um, I'm used to it but I, I do get drifted away in the dynamics like still when I'm playing it so it's still special to me when I'm playing it but it's I still played it many times when I've been practicing it so I'm really used to the sound <laughs> of it and stuff. And what other concertos have you played? Um, I've also played a Kabelowski concerto, one of the movements um, and a Mozart concerto, a Haydn concerto and these, I always competed with them mm-hmm. so yeah. Those concertos. I don't. I'm not exactly sure which movement. Have you looked at any but. Beethoven concertos? Um. No, not yeah. yet. Yeah. But you know them. Yes. Yeah, but you haven't played any yet. Not yet. Yeah, yeah. And so, wh- what is your favorite area of music? In, in other words, what what composers are you, are you attracted to most? Is it classical, romantic, or contemporary, or all, the whole business? Um, well, I kind of like contemporary because the piece I'm playing is definitely a more modern piece because it was composed um, around the around 2000 century, I'm pretty sure. So it's pretty that, recently composed. That's recent. So I like contemporary a little bit more, but I do still like playing classical. I've been playing that for my whole life, since yeah. five. So, yeah. 
Well, the, the, your interest in contemporary music is terrific because there's yeah. not, there aren't enough musicians who are interested in yeah. contemporary music. You better watch out, though, because composers might come after you and uh, yeah. want you to play their pieces because they, they, they need, they, you know, need yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what other interests do you have outside of music? Um, I really like soccer a lot. Um, I'm playing soccer in competitive um, ECNL. It's called ECNL. And... I really like soccer. Um, I like to bake, but soccer is my main thing besides piano. You like to bake? Yeah. Yeah, my daughter is a uh, bake as a hobby. Yeah, it's really fun. As well. In fact, uh, when this is over, I'm going to make you sit through a one minute TikTok video she did. Okay. <laughs> that got 1.5 million views. Oh, wow. Yeah. Nice. And she produced it herself, did all the video, really? and did the voiceover. And it's about how, he, how she met her husband. Really? Yeah, in yeah, one minute. That's cool. So I would play it on this show, but it's probably a little bit too personal, but I'll play it. Yeah. If you <laughs> yeah. have a minute, can you spare a minute? Yeah. yeah, I'll watch that for sure. Yeah, because uh, are you on TikTok? Um, I don't have social media because my parents are a little bit strict when it comes to social media, but I get Instagram next year. But I have like heard of TikTok and I've seen TikToks before. Okay. And I've like seen baking videos about TikTok on TikTok. So. Lots of baking videos. Yeah, She's done sure. a lot. Um, and she's made money. Really? She's registered with them, and she's been doing it about three months, and she has made $75. So I told nice. her, keep your day job, because yeah. she, Go- <laughs> she works for Google, and you yeah. know, they pay better yeah, than that. Definitely. <laughs> but I'll show it to you. So baking, what kind of baking? Um, I like making cakes the most, because I like decorating them and like cutting the layers and like baking like different layers. I like free layers. I always do free layers or four layers. Um, but I actually did consider doing a YouTube, like a YouTube channel called Baking It Right or something like that, like two years ago. And I actually made like a couple of videos, but then I decided not to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and so what's the future for you? Do you think you'll try to pursue music or uh, just enjoy it uh, and, and do other things, go into college and maybe not major in music? Um, not completely sure yet. Maybe I might want to major in music, possibly. Um, but not exactly sure yet, but I'm doing it for fun right now and enjoying it, but possibly likely going to major in it. We'll see, though. I'm not exactly sure yet. Right. Well, you have a little ways to go. Yeah. What year are you in? Um, sophomore year, so 10th grade. Yeah, so you won't even be thinking about college until yeah. next year. Next year, yeah. Well, thanks for coming by. I can't wait to hear your performance tonight. Yeah. And uh, we're, we're all anxious to hear this wonderful new piece. Yes. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Wow, that was Marcella Gonya, a pianist, wonderful pianist, who performed uh, the third movement of Zukovsky's Piano Concerto 
in Carnegie Hall with orchestra. What a privilege she had. And uh, we have a really exciting announcement uh, coming up. We have the James Adler Audience Award. We're going to be announcing that with uh, an amazing uh, uh, producer of this amazing program, uh, Anna Ospenskaya, as well as um, head of the Progressive Musicians, James Welch. Uh, we hope you are enjoying this program. If you're joining us now, we are producing and showing you the amazing interviews that were done by Steve Robinson and each of the winners who performed in Carnegie Hall, the Laureate Scala, uh, very, very recently. And this is an opportunity for you as an audience to understand and get to know the musicians even better. And uh, I hope it doesn't sway the audience favorites award at all, but this is a way for musicians to be more human on camera, on stage, so you get to know them. And Steve Robinson is such a great interviewer, asking great questions, not too personal, but just enough so you understand where they're coming from. And it enriches the whole experience for you as an audience. And you get to hear amazing music and meet amazing musicians who are very, very young, but they're on the cusp of something great to come. Uh, and speaking of something great, uh, we have James Welch from the Progressive Musicians we can bring on stage. Now, um, welcome back, James. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for organizing everything backstage. We talked about the process behind it. And now I want to ask you a little bit about Progressive Musicians and the organization that you're the genius and the mind and the head mm -hmm. behind. I want you to tell us a little bit about it, the, how it formed and what your dreams are for this organization and what's coming up next. Sure. Well, um, it's, it, it, it's really a, a, not, not too long of a story, but it, when my friends and I were near the end of our competing days, we were talking about just how it's so much work to learn all the music, but then so much money to just go all over the world and compete, maybe play for 10 minutes if mm -hmm. we're lucky, and then that's it. And, uh, you know, and we always ask ourselves, well, what's more depressing, that we didn't place or that we just spent five grand to come here and play for 10 minutes and right. it was just like how can we eliminate that and we thought well let's you know th th there's some online competitions but let's see if we can go online and give everybody a little bit more than just their five or ten minutes of mm -hmm. spotlight you know let's give them feedback let's give them chances to make improvements and yeah. you know it, we, we don't have to we, we were with the idea that we didn't have to have the best international superstars but that we could help them get to a higher level through yeah. providing uh every educational tool that we could think of online so we started with that idea where they get a judge's comment and then they come back a week or two later and play again for the real judgment yeah and the real and judgment. part of that improvement was factored into the scoring and mm -hmm. then we would select musicians to play at Carnegie Hall. The fun fact of this is, which I don't think I've ever said publicly before, is we worked all summer of 2019 for this, and around February of 2020, we're like, all right, the website's ready, the contracts have been signed, let's launch yeah. it. So we hit launch on the website, it goes live maybe two weeks later. COVID! And... Uh. And I, my business partner at the time was like, well, what do we do? I, 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 what, what are we going to do? I'm like, nothing. We're all set. <laughs> we're online. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We're just going to have to delay the winner's reset a little bit. But, um, And we, we just took one sigh of relief and then put up a message, and people seemed to be flocking to us. I, I, I call it a happy accident. I mean, I don't want to. Mm -hmm, say mm -hmm. uh, associate covid with anything happy but i mean it, it, it was weird how that worked out and you know since then we've been doing different variations of that uh format online and finally we got to carnegie for the first time in february of 2022 which was our first recital where people from over the years at that point weren't just came in and played their hearts out in Wild Recital Hall. And it was so fun. And the feedback was just overwhelming to the point where we knew that we definitely had to do this 
again. And at that point, amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At that point. So can you? Yeah, go, go on, ahead. Sir, go on. Oh no. Well, I was gonna say at that point, I had already uh, formed a relationship with Anna and Sound Espressivo, and we mm -hmm. were mm -hmm. talking. Well, what if we did one of these together? And so we did. And, Brilliant. And Brilliant. we're gonna be doing it again in June, and yeah, many yeah, yeah. others. And it, it, it's this. This. It's just really, really been a lot of fun and almost a dream come true for a lot of people. I mean, I'm not in this to promote myself so much, but I mean, it's just like we do this and we hear wonderful music. We yeah. promote other musicians. We help them get to the next level. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's just, you know, it's it's just the funnest thing so in the world. So for people who are watching, and uh, tell us a bit about how they can support progressive musicians and Sound Espressivo. What can people do uh, apart from, you know, applying for the competitions and audition rounds? Well, how can we support this amazing initiative that you're doing? Well, I mean, support, I mean, you know, um, we... We, we always take donations, but I mean, I mean, as far as money goes, I mean, that's really the last support thing that I would probably ask for at this point. But one of the first things that I would take if someone offered it, of course, you know, I mean, nobody turns down money. But, um, but, um, I hope not. yeah, I mean, no. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, just, you know, spread the word about what we do, you know, from studio to studio, teacher to teacher. And, yeah. Um, we're always looking for new adventures and new ideas, and we're also looking to do more localized programming uh -huh, of uh -huh, recitals. Okay. Um, you know, th this whole idea of being international uh, is great, but I mean, you need to have a few other steps in that process to sure, work up yeah. to international competition. So th that that's one of our next ventures is hopefully providing opportunities for local communities or just within a state excellent and that sounds really still good. doing online and finding a venue and yeah. then encouraging people to keep moving forward absolutely no i i really love what you're doing thank you james thank you thank for you. all your hard work and thank you for coming to talk to us about what you're doing i uh, really appreciate you putting all this effort in to make musicians dreams come true and if you want to support us um check us out sound a specific competition progressive musicians uh virtual concert halls .com. we are on social media we are everywhere that you can find us on the internet because we want to come to you and we want to broadcast programs that are accessible to you and if you're a student or music teacher make sure you check us out because there are a lot of amazing events to come now our last uh contestant that we're going to show you tonight is very special she her name is teresa allies she's going to be playing the castanets and she flew all the way from spain to perform for us and she's world famous she's a incredible musician during uh the carnegie hall laureates Ella, she performed uh Two Hungarian dancers, number four and number five by Brahms, uh, with orchestra with the New York Chamber Players, conducted by Maestro Giacomo Franchi. And here we have some clips of her playing, as well as her meetings with orchestra, and of course, her interview with Steve Robinson. Please enjoy. Bum, bum, ba, 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 ba. 
So, poco ritenuto means poco, like not much, but usually, tra traditionally, is, is play ritenuto, not poco. Like, pam, pam, pa, pa. And mm -hmm. I don't think Abrams meant that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, if you agree with me, I would, uh, I would do it poco, like tan, 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 a little bit more. Yes, okay. So I don't know if you can adapt to that. If you can't, then we'll do it what everybody does. Uh, yes, I suppose uh, I can. Um, I have followed, I don't know if you want to, to hear, to, um, to listen the... Um, I just want to know from you. See the 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 base uh, I had for well, it was the same that in the video. Okay, uh, more or less. Yeah, no? yeah. So it's the same as in the video. I would have to do ritenuto like usually. Pa, 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 I don't. I don't know. So yes. Um, that you probably are used to that. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Teresa and Rodrigo, welcome to Carnegie Hall and the Wild Recital Hall. And we're doing an interview about your performance tonight, uh, Teresa, uh, which is a solo uh, a, a concerto you're playing on castanets. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about how you developed the skill and, and the virtuosity on these instruments. Well, I, I used to dance in, in the past. So with Spanish dancing, uh, we usually learn how to play castanets. But for dancing, it's a very simple way of playing. But afterwards, I, um, I met uh, Maestro Jose Dudaeta, who was a, a very good uh, castanet soloist. And um, it was in 25. Uh, so almost 20 years ago, I I am focused professionally uh, in castanets as a solo instrument, and then I developed my own method of teaching this instrument, and and I created an online school and a, a, the international castanet festival and a competition of Castanet for the year, so many things about uh, you cre You created the competition? Hmm. And where is that held? Uh, it's, it's going to be um, held th this uh, in February. Now we have the semifinals and the, uh, we will have the finals in, in February. Mm -hmm. and, where, and where is the competition? Is it online or...? It was online uh, for the first uh, tires, and the, the final will be during the the ninth uh, international festival in Madrid. In Madrid. Uh, yes, for uh, in February mm -hmm. next year. Yeah, and you also arrange um, pieces for the castanets. Yes. What kind of pieces do you arrange? Well, I I like to to do all kind of uh, different styles. Uh, also classical music, which is not so um, uh, typical, no, for castanets. But uh, I I usually write the the scores for the arrangements, and uh, both for classical music or Spanish music or popular music, for uh, from all countries, even jazz and flamenco and well, all, everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, I want to talk a bit about the piece you're playing tonight, but first, Rodrigo, you are with the consulate in New York City? Uh, yeah, that's right. And what is your position there? Um, well, we do as much as we can to promote uh, Spanish culture in New York, um, all of the genres, all of the arts, um, and in this case, music and live music. Yeah. Have you ever worked with a castanet soloist before? Uh, no, this is <laughs> my first time. I think it's very unique. Um, it's definitely... Um, as you were saying, a rare solo instrument. Right. Did you were you here last night? Did you see any of the rehearsal? Um, I wasn't lucky enough to be here last night, um, but I will today. Right. So tell us a bit about the piece you're playing tonight. 
Yes, I'm, I'm going to play the Hungarian dances, number four and five. By? Uh, Brahms. Ah, uh, Brahms, okay. Yes, and um, well, these are um, two pieces I like very much. And they are full of contrast, so it gives me the opportunity to express a lot of emotions, different emotions, and I think uh, it would be nice to hear. Do you, uh, when you're transcribing um, the Brahms Hungarian dances, which are written for piano originally or, or for orchestra? Uh, the, the, the original composition. The, uh, I, I used to, to be based on the original scores. For, for orchestra. For orchestra, orchestra yeah. Yeah. And so when you write the castanet part, mm. um, is it your own rhythms that you're adding to it or... Yes. Yes. I I add some arrangements and I do a, a different line of melody. Sometimes following the the principal melody and sometimes accompanying the the back instruments or well I play with the with the rhythms and also with the colors of sound because uh, castanet it seems to be a very simple instrument, but uh, you can, with uh, only, in, uh, for example, uh, what we call a toque, toque, no, un toque, uh, well, um, oh. well, um, a, a simple note, imagine, uh, it can sound in a very different kinds of Sounds, mm -hmm, <laughs> colors mm -hmm. of sound. No? It depends on the position you 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 play, or the distance of hands from the body. Mm -hmm. So it changes the the quality of sound. Mm -hmm. So we we play with um, rhythms and also with that uh, mm -hmm. to to enlarge the the richness. Right, and do you write uh, the, your part out? Yes. So you're, you're, it's written out, and in, you're you're playing from a written out. You've memorized it because I noticed you weren't looking at any music, but it's something that's written out and composed. Yes, we 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 write the scores as uh, with a normal solfege, uh, solfeo, solfege, uh, solfa, solfa. No, it, with a, it's rhythm uh, mm -hmm. with uh, normal notes. Right, uh, notation. But uh, notation, yes. But uh, it is only in a bigramma instead of a pentagramma. It's only bigramma because we write the in the first line the um, the um, the things for the right hand and in the low line oh. for the left. In the middle, we write the silence and the post postizeos, which are the um, the, the crushing of castanets when they really so it's th three lines the, the left no, hand a, the, the, the line one line another line and in the middle right. in the space empty space we write the silence and the crushing of castanets and the bottom line is left hand top line is yes. right hand hmm. oh, very exciting very interesting yeah mm -hmm. uh, what other pieces uh, do you perform besides the Brahms I'm sure many well, um, I have uh, pieces of Vivaldi, uh, uh, Mozart, Beethoven, uh -huh. Haydn, Boccherini, uh, well, many. Uh, and then uh, typical uh, classical Spanish like um, uh, Albéniz. Um, well, I have uh, also some of uh, Carmen from the opera. Uh, all the, well, almost all the zarz zarzuelas. So uh, really, yeah. You know, um, um, is there any repertoire for solo, unaccompanied uh, castanets? Just just one performer, no instruments. Well, I sometimes I do solos. A solo, in, but not all the concert, of course, because it, it's <laughs> going to be very boring. But uh, sometimes in a concert, just a little mm -hmm. piece uh, or. Um, uh, yes, uh, right. sometimes I have done that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm very eager to see the performance. I just saw a little bit of it last night on tape, and it was a rehearsal, so this will be very different. And Rodrigo, I'll look forward to seeing you at the concert. Thank you. 
And likewise, yeah. very keen as well. It starts soon. It's at 8. So, yes, that's it. So we have to get ready. But thank you very much for coming by. It's a pleasure to meet you, and I'm very eager to hear the piece. Thank you very much. Wonderful. That was Teresa Lies on castanets uh, performing uh, a little bit of the Brahms fourth and fifth Hungarian dance. And uh, there was a snippet of a rehearsal. And there's a reason it is called rehearsal. There's a lot of things to work on and to put together. And with, with orchestra, we have uh, Giacomo Franchi as the maestro and conductor behind uh, the New York Chamber Players. We are really privileged to have this and uh, her amazing little snippet of an interview with Steve Robinson. We are really uh, um, just floored by the fact that she came from Spain all the way. Uh, she's beside her. We had uh, the consulate uh, of Spain in New York City uh, alongside. And it's, it's just a combination of many different cultures put together and performing in one of the biggest stages and the most important stages in the world. Now, uh, we have one final thing to announce. James audience award we had didn't get a chance to announce that uh, earlier and because of this part two of our story the Carnegie uh, Laureate Scala uh, we get to announce this amazing award and here to announce it uh, is uh, one of the co-founders of Sound and Specific Competition and Osman Skaya and the director behind Progressive Musicians, James Welch. Please welcome them onto the virtual stage. Welcome back. Thank you, you both. <laughs> how, Thank you so how, how's everything going? Are you enjoying this, the interviews and everything? Incredible interviews. I want to say many, many thanks to Steve Robinson for conducting those interviews. Uh, those are yeah, great he's questions. A real pro. He's amazing. Oh my gosh, great. no wonder that all over the world people watch his programs and uh, uh -huh. listen to his radio productions and um, exactly. he put together incredible pro uh, programs about classical music and musicians and um, he just brings so much interesting um, uh, stories from uh, yep. behind uh, the music that people play and uh, their personal stories. It's wonderful to... Absolutely. I'm glued to, to those interviews. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, James... Um, it's that time everyone were uh, eagerly waiting for the announcement of the James Adler um, yes. audience favorite word. We so I'm sure you've, you've sorted it out, who's going to announce it. And so I'm going to let you decide who announces it. You know, uh, this is a great award. And uh, we thank you, James Adler. Can you, uh, Dr. Anna, could you tell us a bit about James Adler and our relationship with him, how this award came about? Absolutely. So that, that's uh, exactly what I wanted to just introduce a little bit. Um, yeah. um, James Adler is a fabulous pianist, a uh, graduate of Curtis Institute, and uh, he's currently in New York and performing and recording, and he's also a composer. So uh, the organization, um, Adler Oaks uh, Library, is sponsoring this award. And uh, James, went, well, I'll let him speak in his own words, but I know the first time we talked with him about um, mm -hmm. possibly 
possibly introducing this kind of award, James was very excited to really encourage musicians to develop and nurture their following um, and their community of supporters. Um, because, you know, classical music um, can be appreciated by many. And um, people sometimes feel a little bit apprehensive uh, uh, looking at those glorious musicians on six foot tall stages. Um, but musicians are very accessible and we need that human connection with um, people. So James was very excited wow. and he had told me for him, a community of supporters and audience and uh, people who love music and love his playing, love his compositions was mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. one of the most um, nurturing and exciting and uh, um, things of being a musician. Yeah. So he yeah. and the uh, Adler Oaks Library are sponsoring a $250 award. This is the second time they're offering this award. First time was last year during Sunday's specific competition. And this yep. year uh, they'll be awarding two of those awards. Uh, one today will be uh, yeah. will be naming the winner of this award and yeah. uh, there will be another word um, given at on um, to the uh, one of the um, laureates at June 20th uh, laureates uh, gala at uh, Carnegie Hall. Wonderful. So yeah and we have the address from directly from James. Um, uh, I believe he's going to say who won it and let me yeah. just give you a little background so we uh, of course spread the word and conducted the a poll and people um, voted and sent us their votes we had a lot of votes mm -hmm. um, then we had to count them and make sure that um, every one of those votes is properly counted and sorted out and then um, then we came up with the winner so it took a while i know everybody were eagerly waiting um i guess uh, we'll be soon moving on to actually announcing the winner james you had something to aid, add to that no i think you got it all I, i'm just too excited i i want to know who won <laughs> <laughs> well yeah. i no i already do know so yeah. i have no more opposite. teasing let's get it do. let's get it going tell me yeah <laughs> Tell everyone. <laughs> I have the other biggest problem. People keep kept ta asking me, well, just tell me secretly, please. And I have a, you know, I have that urge to, <laughs> to tell people, but I kept my mouth zipped. <laughs> you good. Tell you. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's Hello, hear from James, James Adler, Adler and then Yamaha the Yamaha Concert Artist and President of the Adler Oaks Music Library, sponsor of the James Adler Audience Favorite Award. On behalf of virtual concert halls, progressive musicians, and our advisory boards and members, I want to thank all those who participated and voted. The total number of fully eligible votes worldwide was 1,118. Yay! We're glad to have had your collective voices heard. The winner of the James Adler Audience Favorite Award is, drumroll please, Antia Diaz, age 16 from Goa, India. Congratulations, Antia, and thank you all for participating in voting. Your vote does count. Happy holidays, everyone. Yay! Yay! Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Antia, oh, congratulations. Wow. I hope she's watching now and everybody congratulations. else. Congratulations. Wow. That's excellent. Yeah. Drum! <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Congratulations, Antia. I hope the trip was worth it. And now you not only have the, the, the have had the opportunity to play in Carnegie Hall, but also to have won the James Adler Audience Favorite Award. Congratulations. And we also have you to thank Dr. Anna um, and James Welch for putting all of this together and making it so fun for everybody. Thank you, Chris. Thank it was an enormous amount of fun for me. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So what's what's next? Tell, uh, Dr. Anna, tell us a little bit about what's next. You hinted about the second laureate gala. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about it and what, what we can expect? We can expect more 
fabulous music, mm-hmm. great yes. artists, more Amazing. wonderful interviews on mm-hmm. June twentieth. I will be soon announcing the program and who is going to be on that um, glorious uh, gala concert at the <laughs> Carnegie Hall on June twentieth. And we have more concerts. Um, we're organizing uh, co orchestra concerts with the various orchestras and uh, lots of other plans. And of course, going to be reaching out to the audience through our wonderful programs like this one and I want yeah. to thank Chris for your great hosting bravo My pleasure. My pleasure. Wonderful. thank you all for everything yeah this is you're been a so real fun pleasure. and entertaining oh that's <laughs> that's a great host <laughs> thank you. Mm. and I also I, yeah, thank mm-hmm. our magicians behind the scene yes. the musicians who are producers, sound and video engineers, and directors of these shows. Thank you very, very much. Our mysteriously unseen magic hands behind uh, Fran Rusinovich, our um, technical director and director of this show, and Fyodor Spensky, our artistic director and the director of this show. And also many thanks to everyone else on Virtual Concert Hall's team uh, who may not be in the midst of the action right now, but working hard and preparing the systems that um, methods and the ways of producing those live shows and the visuals and the graphics and scripts and there's a lot which goes into preparation thank you everyone who you see on this screen my deepest bow to you your professional musicians you're maintaining um, performing teaching and uh, other musical careers and you are also our magic vehicle to um, help musicians reach out farther and wider beyond the limitations of the brick and mortar concert halls. We love the concert halls, Definitely. but we love this connection too. Yeah, thank you so much to the team behind Virtual Concert Halls. It's always a pleasure working with you. And a big hand to you, James, making it all happen um, uh, behind the scenes, especially backstage in, in the real life events. And uh, with that, we're going to say a goodbye. And also a big thanks to all our judges again, uh, Dr. Benjamin Hansen, choir director. Uh, uh, we also want to thank Daniel Ihaz, Emil Shunovsky, uh, Elizabeth Mann, Pierre Baudry, Paul Coleman, uh, James Welch, and of course, Maestro Giacomo Franchi. We want to thank Steve Robinson and his team for making such beautifully shot interviews and sending it to us. We want to thank, of course, Dr. Anna Ospinskaya, Igor Subkovsky, John Karpov, Karpov of the Karpov Cello School, Piano Piano Rehearsal Hall, uh, Re- Rehearsal Studios. We want to thank our producers, Fedor Ospensky and Frane Rizinovich. And um, everybody, all of you, reach out to us if you want to help us and support us. We do need your help to make these programs work. And it's not just about financial support, but also your physical support. Uh, We have so many events lined up and it's important that you not only support us because we're supporting musicians, but you are there to, as an audience, to support musicians who may need that extra platform to get their voices heard, may need that extra support from the judges or from the audience to feel a bit more confident about expressing themselves through music. A lot of musicians are generally um, sometimes introverted and have no means to express themselves apart from using art and music. And so this is a channel and a platform for them to showcase what they have to say to the world. And to give them the confidence of that, we are offering opportunities for them to actually perform. So if you want to support us, check out our websites. We have Sound Espresivo Competition, we have virtualconcerthalls.com. We are on Facebook, we are on YouTube, we are on LinkedIn. Uh, reach out to us because it would be a pleasure for you, uh, for us to have you as our supporter. And with that, we'll catch you very soon. Have a very good evening wherever you're at and take care. See you soon.